So I wanted to talk about a few important concepts when we talk about nutrition. And so when we look at a few of those foods, a question that we often ask ourselves is gluten harmful for patients with autoimmune thyroid condition? And we know that the gluten-free industry is blossoming, right? It's a multi-million dollar industry and made a lot of money from offering those products to patients, sometimes under the claims of being healthier, being more beneficial. And so let's take a look at some of the research and see if we can determine for ourselves. Interestingly, there was a study, a small clinical trial with 34 women with autoimmune thyroiditis, and they were put on gluten-free diet for six months, and it reduced the thyroid antibody titers. So I'm going to start by saying this is a very controversial topic, right? Gluten basically refers to as a family of proteins known as prolamines and include mostly glutenine and gliadin that constitute the storage protein in many of the cereal grains, such as wheat, barley, and rye. There was a review study that published in 2022 and concluded that there is currently no evidence that a gluten-free diet is beneficial in an autoimmune Hashimoto disease. And we also have to consider that the whole grains diet contains healthy nutrients such as fiber that is very beneficial in the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now, obviously we're not talking about white bread or highly processed wheat, which is deprived of the fiber and the nutrients in a shell of the wheat grain. We're talking about the whole wheat, whole grain diet that was found to be beneficial. But let's look at the possibility that there might be some truth to the claim that gluten-free diet is healthier for us. And so when we look at this interesting picture from this study published in 2020, we can see that there's three different types of reactions to gluten. And we're all familiar with the autoimmune reactions, such as the celiac disease, that even in very small amounts of gluten exposure leads to a very strong flare-up of the GI system. And we're also familiar with the allergic reaction, which is food allergy that can lead to respiratory allergy. But there's also a third type, which is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And it's caused by gluten and carbohydrates present in, the, in wheat such as FODMAPs, which stands for formidable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polys, alpha amylase, trypsin inhibitors, and wheat germ. Those alpha amylase trypsin inhibitors, or ATIs, are capable of triggering the TLR4 present on myelite cells, leading to the release of pro-inflammatory cells. So the major symptoms of non-celiac gluten sensitivity in patients include abdominal bloating and pain, diarrhea, nausea, changing bowel habits is one of them. For example, they can have something that's similar to irritable bowel syndrome, but it's important to mention that some patients could have non-GI symptoms, including brain fog, fatigue, tiredness, lack of well-being or headaches, depression, anxiety, joint pain. Those are all inflammatory reactions as a result of not antibodies necessarily, but an immune activation. These symptoms typically disappear when gluten is removed from the diet for at least a few days. That's a good way. And then you can reintroduce them. Typically, you can remove them for about a week, seven to 10 days, introduce them, introduce gluten back, and then see, monitor the first four days, four or five days of eating gluten. If the patient reports symptoms coming back worsening uh, or new symptoms develop, then it is likely that they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Another way to measure is there's a test called ALKET test. And ALKET test is measuring for food sensitivity, not antibodies, uh, but immune reaction that is triggered basically as a result of encountering certain foods. ALCAT, and it's offered by Cell Science and also a company called SpectraCell. And today you can actually measure not just gluten, but a variety of sensitivities for different foods. I think uh, both of these offer over 200 measurements of sensitivity for over 200 different foods. And it's always 
interesting to see when we run those tests and we worked on other aspects of the patient, the patient's gut, reducing environmental factors, and we're still struggling with a patient that's have those symptoms. We will typically invest the time and money into doing the ALKET test, the food sensitivity. It's a very simple, straightforward presentation of these are the foods the patient is have a severe reaction, moderate and mild and no reaction. And guess what? I would say like 80% of the time when we run those labs, the results come back and the patient looks at the foods that are in the red, severe reaction. And in many cases, they tell us that's the foods I'm eating and that's the food I love eating most of the time, right? And once we remove those foods, then we've seen patients with a variety of autoimmune conditions from arthritis, MS, from initial stage of dementia, from chronic fatigue that significantly improve once we find out what are they eating that is triggering this, um, this immune reaction, right? Now, it's not going to impact everybody. And that's why I started this little segment about gluten uh, because Obviously, eating a whole grain diet is important, uh, but just remember that some patients out there have a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and it is possible that they also have sensitivity to other foods. Okay, so certain human leukocytes antigen, DQ2 T cell haplotypes have been identified in proline-rich sequences of gliadin, such, such as the gliadin peptide of 33 residues, alpha-2 gliadin 5789, which after degradation by intestinal tissue, transglutaminase, it has been shown to be a strong stimulator of T lymphocytes. Animal study published in 2013 reported that gluten-containing standard diet markedly changed the cytokine expression of all lymphoid organs tested towards a higher expression of pro-inflammatory interferon gamma, interleukin-17, and interleukin-2. Individual with non-cilia gluten sensitivity might experience inflammation and increased permeability of the intestinal mucosa. So here's other mechanisms in which our patients could develop an immune reaction as a result of gluten, right? It could be the, the processing and breakdown of gluten to different metabolites. It could be, for example, the increase of permeability. One interesting study that we talk about during the gut health module is this interesting study that was done with patients that had non-celiac gluten sensitivity and healthy individuals. And they found that all of them, when consumed gluten, had the secretion of zonulin which opens up the tight junctions in the gut, leading to increased hyperpermeability. Just remember that when you are talking to patients or working with patients. And of course, when we consider that, unfortunately, in the United States and many other countries, GMOs are now becoming more and more common. And this is a direct quote from an interesting study published in 2018, as new gluten peptides emerge via genetic modification, resulting from modern agriculture practices, more immune activating gluten peptides may be seen in food. So basically what this author was saying is that the gluten that our grand grandparents used to eat, and even our grandparents, the bread that they used to eat is not the bread that we are buying now in the convenience stores. It is modified, and introduced new types of peptides that could be seen as foreign to our body. If you want to see specifically what happens to animals that eat just GMO food, there's a module that is now being introduced specifically about this topic. It's been introduced into the student platform. Uh, but just remember that uh, one of the ways to avoid this, obviously, is to buy food that is labeled as non-GMO or food that is organic. Both of those, the organic label is required to not contain any genetically modified species. Okay, let's talk about where wheat is found. And so interestingly, gluten is in so many products that you've never thought that it should be. Cornflakes or morning cereals with kids contains malt from barley. 
that's gluten. Our salad dressing that we buy, even some ketchup or mustard's company contains gluten. Some cheese products, meat substitutes. Most of the vegetarian products out there are made from wheat protein or hydrolyzed wheat. And then restaurants sometimes use scrambled eggs in their omelet with their omelet mixtures just to make it a little bit more fluffy. Processed and flavored potatoes or corn chips. It also used sometimes as a binder in different supplements. Barley malt is used as a powder in candies, uh, seasoned rice, soy sauce, soup and ready meals. And then of course, shampoos have what's sometimes referred to as hydrolyzed wheat protein. And so when you are working with patients that you know they have the sensitivity to gluten, make sure to educate them about the sources of gluten 